everyone. I'm Anthropomantic Fiends, and I do horror-related things on the internet. And you might notice that I'm somewhere I haven't been in a while. I am currently on Christmas break, so I'm back in my room now, filming a Heart of the Night Reviews review here for the first time since June, July, something like that. Maybe, maybe even May? I don't know. When was it that Baphomet? came out. I don't remember when I put out that review, but it's been a minute. So yeah, no, that would have that would have been June or July, definitely not May. But anyway, today I am reviewing another film that was requested to me by James Moss. I will be linking his channel in the cards above. He's got a couple Friday the 13th reviews up on there. Go check them out. And it is also the movie that got the second most amount of votes on the poll I put out a couple weeks ago. The first of those was, of course, Creepshow. My review of that just came out. Go check that out, please. That took so much time to make. But today, I am reviewing Shocker from 1989. And this is a film that was directed by Wes Craven, horror legend, of course, known for movies like A Nightmare on Elm Street, Scream, and The Last House on the Left. The film stars Mitch Pileggi, who was on TV shows like The X-Files and Supernatural and in movies like Polaroid. Camille Cooper, who was in Lawnmower Man 2, Meet the Applegates, and Like Father, Like Son. Peter Berg, who was in Deepwater Horizon, The Last Seduction, and Smoke and Aces. And Featuring a brief appearance from Heather Langenkamp, who is of course known for being in the Elm Street franchise, as well as in movies like Hellraiser Judgment, Truth or Dare from 2017, and The Cabin in the Woods. Oh, and Ted Raimi is also in this movie. He's a minor character, but he's there. I thought I should mention him. And this film follows a kid named Jonathan. He seems to kind of have his head in the clouds a lot. He's a bit of a dreamer, which is pertinent to the story. For that reason, he's kind of struggling a little bit on his football team. But that is kind of the least of his worries, because pretty soon he has a dream about a murderer named Horace Pinker, and he dreams that this murderer murders his mom and his sister. And shortly thereafter, he finds out that this has actually happened and is able, just based on his dream, able to give the police a detailed description of what Horace Pinker looks like, lead them via another dream to his next murder location, then apprehend him and give him the electric chair. But before that happens, Horace Pinker makes a deal with a supernatural entity of some kind. I think it's presumed to be the devil, but we don't know. And is able to harness the power of electricity to stay alive, inhabiting other people's bodies, even after having been given the electric chair and by inhabiting other people's bodies is able to continue his string of murders and it is up to Jonathan and his loved ones to stop Pinker. So the music for this film was done by William Goldstein. He also scored movies like Terror Out of the Sky and An Eye for an Eye and scored a few episodes of the Twilight Zone reboot series. And the score is decently spooky. It mostly is background music. There's a few moments where it kind of becomes front and center and there's some really cool, like, open-sounding, like, synthy passages that were fun, but mostly it just serves as solid, spooky background music. The soundtrack, on the other hand, is awesome. We get an opening theme by a band called Dudes of Wrath, which is a wonderful band name. The title track is, of course, called Shocker. It plays during the opening credits, and it's just a really solid, like, 80s metal deal. We also get a cover of... No More Mr. Nice Guy by Alice Cooper, as performed by Megadeth, as they're setting up the electric chair for Pinker's electrocution, which is a weird tonal choice, which is something this film does a lot. But it's still really fun to hear Megadeth covering Alice Cooper. And there's a few other just really solid, like, 80s rock and metal tracks throughout the film. I really liked Jonathan as a main character. I 
kind of found him just to be like a generic dude bro who is way too focused on romantic and sexual pursuits at first, but I really grew to like him quite a bit, mostly because he's the character we follow through most of the film, but he's very well acted and he's just a very solid, likable character. I really enjoy his interactions with the other characters as well. The dynamic between him and his girlfriend is really one that I feel like especially a lot of like 80s horror films doesn't have as much well where he seems to be much more kind of dependent on her and she's kind of the protective force in his life and I really liked that and I really liked the dynamic between him and his football team and his friends on the football team as well because usually it feels like the kind of thing where again in a lot of like 80s slasher movies there would be a lot of like infighting between these kinds of characters and at first we see a little bit of that with Jonathan kind of bumbling around running into a goalpost and knocking himself unconscious and the coach kind of yelling at him to get his head out of the clouds and you've kind of got Ted Raimi in the background I think his nickname is Pac-Man for some reason uh because he's like the nerd character. He's the nerd with the glasses who's like there with a clipboard by the coach all the time. But they kind of have these moments where they snap at each other a little bit, but they're never like at each other's throats. Like that's never a plot point. They're all There's always like this sense of camaraderie between all of them and this just tr- sense of true friendship that like carries through the entire film. And I thought that was wonderful. Uh, I'm less sure how I feel about Jonathan's dad. He's very intense. The first time, Jonathan tells him, and granted, grief is a powerful thing, but right after his family has died, also, I should just say, this is very much a spoilery review. If you don't want this movie spoiled for you, go watch it now. But shortly after the death of his mom and his sister, he and his dad are just sitting there and he tells his dad, you know, I had a dream about this happening. No, you don't understand. I had the dream before you told me what happened. And I saw it exactly like this. I literally even know what the blood smelled like. And I know that the killer has a limp. I know what he looks like, dad. And he freaks out. He like, storms out of the building at first and is like, I'm not taking any more of this shit. And then when his son like pursues him, he like slams him up against like a telephone pole and is like, what's wrong with you, son? Are you on drugs? And he's just very aggressive. Granted, he's a cop. So yeah, there's a certain degree of just aggression and unlikability that I guess comes with the territory. But there is also just a sense that he's been put through the ringer and he's kind of aggressive for that reason. So I don't hate him as a character. He's just harder to like, I guess. So I kind of was back and forth on him. But regardless of whether I like him or not, he's still a very good character. I like Pinker as a villain because even though he kind of becomes this supernatural force later, he never feels like some kind of mythologized monster like Freddy, Jason, or Michael, because, like, Freddy's basically a guy who became a nightmare demon. I mean, this is a Wes Craven movie, and there are things about Pinker once he kind of takes on his supernatural form that feel very Elm Street-esque, but there's this sort of sense of truly, like, completely being in control of just this insane supernatural power, and Freddy's just like a dream demon, basically, at this point. And with Michael and with Jason, there's just this sense of like inhuman, unstoppable, still kind of like this demonic supernatural force to them. And with Horace Pinker, he's just a piece of shit guy, basically. He's just this big burly man with a knife at first. And even once he starts like possessing other people's bodies, he's still just like a shitty guy with a knife. And he feels like a far more realistic serial killer in that way. He's just this stupid, horrible dude, basically. He's made to be this very love-to-hate kind of character, but I also get the sense that Mitch Pelegi is having a ton of fun playing him, and he does have a lot of, like, fun one-liners and just, like, over-the-top, maniacal laughing moments that were very enjoyable. And one of the people that Pinker inhabits is this sweet little girl. At first, I was just like, aw, she's just the cutest little jump scare ever because she, like, inadvertently jump scares Jonathan at one point, and she's just like, 
oh, I'm sorry I ran into you with my bike. And he's like, yeah, it's okay. You just you just hit my funny bone. And clearly, like, he's been through a lot more than having his funny bone hit. And he's just like, J just be more careful. And she's just like, okay, I will. I'm sorry. And she goes on her way. And she's just adorable. And then she gets possessed by Pinker. And she, like, tries to run Jonathan over with, like... God, I should know what this stuff is. I was obsessed with Bob the Builder as a kid, but with like, God damn it, what is it? It's freaking building vehicle equipment thing. I'll put the name down here once I figure out what it is. But she like becomes very aggressive and she says asshole and fucker. And I gotta wonder what parent was okay with that. I mean, it's very entertaining in the film and swear words are kind of only nasty because we let them be. But still, I'm surprised that she got to say those words. I was very taken aback at first in the best way. And yeah, she, she just murders people and it's wild. And plot wise, I thought it was really cool. It's very intriguing, but also very confusing all kind of at the same time. Ultimately, I like it, but I could see why some people don't because it really kind of plays it loose with the mythology of what's going on kind of in the way a movie like phantasm does to be honest because when you're watching phantasm there are things about it that feel very clearly planned out and it deals with a lot of like significant themes in a cool way but it also kind of feels like they're just making up ideas as they go along sometimes and this movie kind of feels that way too. We never really get an explanation for why Jonathan can see Pinker in his dreams. He just kind of is able to basically astral project into situations and then like manifest in places and suddenly fight with Pinker even before Pinker makes any kind of deal with this supernatural being or anything like that. There's there's literally no explanation for that given. It's kind of weird, but I'm cool with it. And then another thing that I actually really do like about the overall story for this film is it feels like it deals with grief in a very real way. That's another thing that I think Phantasm tends to do really well, but also sometimes kind of doesn't. The whole franchise, I'm going off on a tangent about Phantasm now, I'm sorry, is very much about like death as this omnipresent force. But like one of the first scenes in that is just like Reggie and Jody talking and being like, oh, bummer, man, our friend committed suicide, sucks. And it doesn't feel as like really aggressively downtrodden as an event like that should feel. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just like internalized, but they seem to be taking it well. Then in a movie like this, there are a lot of like deaths. There are a lot, a lot of deaths in this movie and a lot of deaths of people that are close to Jonathan. And every time one of those deaths happens, the movie takes time to show him like really get fucked up by it. Like they make sure that the deaths like hit you hard. They're not just like, okay, on to the next thing, like some slasher movies, even like good ones that I love will do occasionally because a lot of those movies are just about the intensity and the gore and the fun. And this one is not that. The deaths definitely hit Jonathan hard and by extension hit the viewer hard. Another logic thing that I found weird is I'm kind of surprised that... So basically, after Jonathan's mom and sister get killed, he talks to his dad and talks to the rest of the police and basically tells them about the guy he saw in his dream. And they like do a police sketch based on it. And they literally print a story about him in the newspaper being like, oh yeah, this is kind of a weird thing for the police force. The killer has now been identified because of, I don't know if the dude's chief of police, I feel like he is, but like son of the chief of police having a dream about him. I'm very surprised that the newspaper was willing to print that because I feel like the newspaper would be like, no, people will think we're full of shit if we print this. And I'm surprised that Jonathan let them print it because I feel like he would not want Pinker to know any kind of personal information about him. And it really does come back to bite him because we see this newspaper article and we see and we hear them talking about it on the news on TV simultaneously like in Pinker's little lair and he like rips out this image of the kid and he's like I'm gonna target this kid because he's fucking up my life but yeah I feel like both the newspaper and Jonathan 
really didn't think that through. And then once they apprehend Pinker and he's in his cell, they go to get him to bring him to the chair. His like last request was like a TV of some kind. And he's like got himself wired to the TV and like electricity is surging through his veins. He's got like candles and a big book open and he's clearly like doing some incantation and then he goes please give me the power or something i half expected him to say give me the power i beg of you ala chucky but once he says like give it to me basically like these lips like made like these lips made out of tv static come out of the tv like go up right in his face and just go you got it baby and like zap him full of power who did pinker make this pact with because as of now my best guess is the lips from the opening of rocky horror i mean i'm not complaining about this scene i just have a lot of questions also backpedaling a little bit pretty early on in the movie pinker straight up kills allison who is jonathan's girlfriend and I was kind of bummed by that because I was like, oh, I really like Allison as a character and they just killed her now. And like, it's a, again, it's a big gut punch. All the deaths in this movie hurt, but it felt like they were kind of doing the plot a disservice by killing her early on. And I still kind of feel that way, but Allison keeps coming back in other forms throughout the movie, mostly as kind of a plot device, which I'm kind of eh about, but I still like that they keep bringing her back. Like the first time they bring her back, she's like walking around, but she's like blood spattered and she's like giving Jonathan all these warnings and it's pretty cool. And then in one scene, which I thought was going to be the finale, not knowing that there was like almost a another half hour of the film left. They brought Allison back and she's like translucent now and she's like just emanating light and she's just like this goddess at this point. She's just this all-powerful supernatural being and she's more or less telling Jonathan to like use the power of love to tell his coach who is at that time possessed by Pinker he can overcome this and that he's still in there and so on and so forth but she also just like blasts this beam of light at Pinker and it's pretty great I was fully on board for just badass Allison ghost ex machina which we do not get but I'm glad that she keeps coming back throughout the film because in that sense she never really goes away there's still like not even in the like sappy oh she'll always be in Jonathan's heart way no literally like her supernatural presence never truly leaves like she is always there in some form with him going back to kind of the weird lore there's this cute necklace that Jonathan buys Allison as a birthday present and after she dies it suddenly becomes an amulet it lands on Pinker while he's in the cute little girl's body and suddenly he's visible again after that happens it's like oh shit this is magical for some reason and then it gets thrown to the bottom of a nearby lake by Pinker who is now inhabiting a construction worker with like a pickaxe and he like picks it up on the pickaxe and throws the pickaxe into the lake which stupid move on Pinker's part like I know you need to get rid of that necklace because it's clearly fucking you up but you had a really formidable weapon there and you just threw it to the bottom of the lake. I mean, I shouldn't expect this guy to be smart, but seriously? <laughs> and the necklace just keeps coming back and they just keep never explaining it. I guess it's another like power of love thing, which is cute, but I would have liked some kind of explanation, even a weird convoluted one, but they don't give it. And then the finale of this movie is really, really crazy. Because first of all, Pinker in the body of Jonathan's dad, like climbs with him to the top of this satellite tower where they fight. And then like Jonathan's dad like lands on the satellite dish. And then suddenly like Pinker is like being zapped out of his body, like into the satellite signal. And he's like, I'm going nationwide, baby. And I almost thought that was going to be the ending of the movie and like sequel bait where you would have like shock or two nationwide and there's just like a bunch of Horace Pinkers climbing into everyone's houses through the TV to fuck their shit up but that does not happen. What we do get is one of the craziest finales I've ever seen in a horror movie. I mean I shouldn't say that because I've seen some crazy movies but it felt just insane. First of all, I really like that they bring Jonathan's football 
team members back into the mix. Like he recruits all of them to like get into the city's electricity and mess with it. And there's a scene where they like go in there to like pick the lock on. I I don't understand technology, which is a problem because I used a lot, but they like basically like break into this place and fuck with either the electricity in the city or the satellite signal and they get up to this big like electric box and one of them's like you need to pick that lock and one guy's like that's a felony and the other one's like no that's a lock pick it which is one of my favorite lines in the film and then the movie starts to get really really silly with the whole tv thing because pinker climbs into jonathan's room through the tv but before he does the tv's like on some nature documentary and you'd like hear the narrator like going and here we have the such and such bird in its natural habitat and then you just hear like a stabbing sounds and a thud and Pinker like pops up and starts climbing into the room. So Pinker just like poofed himself into the TV, killed the narrator of the nature documentary who was apparently actually off screen somewhere and climbed into Jonathan's room, which I think is wonderful. But before he climbs into the room, there's like a, a little bit of a like a longer scene. And it's like a good few minutes before we cut back to the guys who have just been like, no, that's a lock, pick it. And by then, they have only just then picked the lock. And it feels like a strangely long amount of time for that to have taken. Like, that was a whole take where they walked up to it and were about to pick the lock. And they just cut it in half, didn't cut anything out, and just put the other scenes in between. It just feels kind of weird pacing-wise. It's not bad, it just feels weird. Or they're just very bad at picking locks, which, hey, I doubt I would be either, so... And then Jonathan has been able to draw Pinker out of the TV and like starts fighting with him. And then Pinker's like, come ride on my Volkswagen, which is the worst pun I've heard in my entire life. And then they dive into the TV together and they're like running through different channels fighting each other. And it's so much fun. Every time I thought this movie couldn't get any crazier, it just kept escalating and I loved it. On the downside, one of the scenes that they run through like in this comedic way it looks to be like actual footage of a riot which should not be displayed on my screen for entertainment especially like with this goofy chase scene inserted into it for any reason fuck that but we also get like a couple music videos one of them is alice cooper they run through the lab scene in the 1931 Frankenstein, which about killed me. They land in somebody's living room and they seem surprisingly okay with it. Sometime before that, they run through a boxing match and like, as they're going by, Pinker just goes, kick his ass and keeps going. And the tone has gone from any kind of dark to just super silly at this point, but I'm very okay with it. And then they wind up back in the real world because of this scheme Jonathan has cooked up with this news broadcaster. And he's like, I know how to draw him into the open and is able to like come into the room because he's broadcasting on TV which is very bold of Jonathan because I barely understand the logic of the TV world and all this electric supernatural stuff. So I don't know how they figured it out, but they draw him out. And then since I guess he's like now abiding by TV rules, they are able to pause Pinker, which I found very entertaining. But then like he starts just pressing buttons and like making Pinker do just like a bunch of other things like jump up and down on the van, like slam him into walls. Like I wouldn't be surprised if Jonathan had made him do jumping jacks. And it's very entertaining, but like the pausing made sense. But like throwing him in the ra around the room doesn't make sense because it it's a TV remote, not like a remote control for Pinker. Like, there's not a do jumping jacks button on the TV remote. It does not work that way. But one of the lines that accompanies that scene is, I just showed you what you can never remember, what it feels like to be victimized, which really brought us back to, like, the heart of the film and the shit that Jonathan has been through and him wreaking vengeance on Pinker in this very satisfying way. I love that line so much. But my note after that just says in all caps, what the what is this ending? Because then he like puts the little heart necklace from Allison like on 
the TV camera. This is Jonathan we're talking about. He like dives into the camera. I don't know what that does. And then somehow because of like the way the kids have lined up the electricity, it like zaps Pinker into oblivion. I don't know, man, your guess is as good as mine. And then effects wise, the visual effects in this movie are very cheesy, but cool. There's a lot of like see through people and people disappearing and reappearing and a lot of very obvious rotoscoping and like hand drawn visual effects, but they're all very charming and I like them. There aren't a ton of practical effects in this movie, but there definitely is some gore and with the gore is gnarly which is like all of a couple occasions it really is excellent and probably the best example of that is a scene where they're dragging pinker to the chair and somebody gets a little too close to his face and pinker literally bites this man's lip and like stretches it and you can like see it stretch it is hard to watch like it hurts to look at and then he like takes a chunk out of somebody else's face and i really feel like they should have uh put him in the hannibal lecter what's this mask mouth guard thing but they didn't think to do that and as a result this man's lip has just been stretched into oblivion and it's quite disturbing and then there is a scene after pinker has like climbed through the tv and he's just like hiding in the room and this weird televangelist guy on the tv who's been just screaming cash for christ this whole time and is hilarious just like walks up to the tv and is just like the beast is among us check the perimeter check the perimeter check the perimeter and like jonathan is sitting in this chair and then the chair like grabs him and like sprouts eyes and turns into pinker again with the lore stuff i don't know why that happens again it's a very cool effect but i don't know why he's able to do that it's friggin weird but it did result in one of my favorite notes i've ever written for a movie review which just says he got the chair now he is the chair so overall shocker very much exceeded my expectations and i had ex expectations of a really solid fun movie based on this being a a Wes Craven directed thing. It definitely is kind of tonally all over the place. The mythology of how the dream stuff works, how the electricity stuff works, how the pact with Satan works, or the pact with the lips from Rocky Horror, or like how the necklace stuff works, or any of it works. None of that really makes sense. But ultimately, the acting was really good, the production values were solid, the effects were fun, and the concepts, while they didn't always like make logical sense, they were always really engaging and fun. And I had a blast watching this movie, and I do highly recommend it to other people who just want a fun horror movie. And if you want to check this one out, I feel like Scream Factory has probably done a solid physical release of this movie. I would definitely not be opposed to picking that up at some point. I rented it off YouTube. It's available to rent off Prime and probably other streaming services as well. So if you want to check it out streaming, you can do that. That is my review of Shocker. Thank you for watching my video, and hopefully I will see you in another one. Bye! <laughs>